Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'd Habatif Allah We reach the portion of the trees talking about the removal of impurities The removal of impurities Meaning how do we clean up najasa If there's najasa in our clothing uh, Or ourselves or what have you How do we clean najasa So as a Muslim is legally required to be pure from minor and major ritual impurities in order to perform the prayer, he is also commanded to purify his body, clothes, and remove any spot of impurity. Allah Taala says, and your clothing purify. The Prophet والسلام, commanded a woman to wash the menstrual blood from her garment. <clears throat> With this in mind, it is our duty to shed more light on this issue, namely the removal of uh, najasa or impurities, illustrating the most important related rulings, hoping that it may benefit Muslims. Uh, the fuqaha, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon them, uh, used to specify a separate chapter in their books uh, entitled a chapter on the removal of impurities, izalata najasa. Uh, and this included all of the, the things that we just talked about, about your place, the place of prayer, your clothing, and your bodies. <clears throat> that all of this is from Islam and all of this is a part of purification. Uh, the asl, the, the basic uh, way in which we remove impurities is through water. So water is the basis of tahara, the water is the basis for removing impurities and <clears throat> cleaning ourselves and preparing ourselves for prayer. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this regard, he says, and sent down upon you from the sky rain by which to purify you. <clears throat> so there are various types of uh, impure objects that must be removed. So impurity may be linked to the ground the floor, or what is connected to them, such as walls, water, basins, rocks, etc. In such a case, it is sufficient to remove such impurity by washing it only once, uh, using pure, uh, to pour water until it covers the impure object. <clears throat> as the Prophet والسلام, ordered to pour a bucket of water over the urine of the Bedouin who had urinated in the masjid. So in a hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, a man in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, uh, a Bedouin, meaning he wasn't he wasn't a learned man, and he was a man from the desert Arabs, you know. So they were tended to be and tend to be very rough people, okay. And they so this man came into the masjid to the the Prophet's masjid, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That in Medina, where's the Prophet's masjid? Have you ever prayed in the Prophet's Masjid? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine someone coming in there and just peeing on the floor? No. Exactly. So this Bedouin, he came in and he urinated in the Masjid. And then the people were very upset and angry and wanted to beat him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Da'hu. He said, leave him. You know, let him finish. Basically, let him finish urinating in the Masjid. So he didn't order him to stop. And then he uh, ordered the people to bring a container of water and throw it on the urine. So that lets us know that the urine or impurities can be washed away with water. Water removes impurities. And there's a lot of hikmah behind that hadith, but this is not the time nor the place to get into the uh, all the fiqh of that hadith. So... Such an impurity is naturally removed when covered with rainwater or floods. So, for example, if you, you, a person urinates outside, which people do all the time, <coughs> it is removed by the natural process of rainwater or in floods or what have you. So long as the impure object is removed by uh, pouring water, meaning that the najasa is removed. So, akramakum Allah, if there's defecation, someone has defecated on the ground, what well, needs to remove all of that defecation, okay? It shouldn't just make it worse, but instead it needs to remove it. So you need to use enough water to remove the najasa, to remove 
the impurity. Uh, and uh, so on the other hand, impurity may not be related to the ground, the floor, or what is connected to them, such as the impurity caused by dogs, swine, meaning uh, pigs, or what is related to them. In this case, the impure object must be washed seven times, one of them with earth, for the Prophet والسلام, said, when a dog licks a utensil belonging to any one of you, let him wash it seven times, the first of them with earth. And this is in uh, Sahih Muslim. So <clears throat> a point being uh, Imam Fozan here, he mentioned uh, uh, pig as well. So there's definitely a, a great difference of opinion with regards to pig because this is from Qiyas. This is from analogy. Because the hadith mentions kelb. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that you should wash the uh, the dog the dog's uh, saliva. Basically, if a if a dog licks in your bowl, you you have a water utensil, then you should pour the water out and you need to wash it seven times. The first time with dirt. Okay. <clears throat> And so, uh, so Imam Fozen mentioned also pig. So some of the scholars, they make payas, they make an analogy from, they're saying, hey, since dog uh, saliva is najasa and must be cleaned in this matter because we have a text, meaning this hadith, likewise, make it, it is analogous that the swine or the, the pig, who is also najas, or, you know, Najis and Khabith, that <clears throat> that also, likewise, you, you do the same thing because it's from a major, it's a major impurity, it's Muharram to eat and so on and so forth and mentioned in the Quran. So from that, they deduce that a poor, a pig is the same ruling. Uh, still, this ruling is not restricted to utensils. It's also applicable to clothing, sheets, and the like. If the impure object is related to neither dogs nor swine, such as urine, stool, blood, and the like, it has to be washed, rubbed, and wrung out until it is completely removed, leaving neither sign nor color. So it should remove the full effect. If you have impurity on your clothing, blood, for example, from height, from uh, uh, a woman's... Uh, period, <clears throat> then uh, you should strive your utmost to get every bit of it out, even the color should be removed, bi'idnillah ta'ala. In general things, wash can be divided into three categories. So general washing can be uh, with with other things aside from that with the najasa, uh, can be washed in three ways. He said, squeezing things such as clothes so they must be wrung out after washing Unsqueezable things such as leather and the like, so they have to be overturned during washing. <clears throat> and things that can neither be wrung out nor overturned, such things have to be washed, scrubbed, and then pressed with a heavy object until most of their water dries. Okay? So he's talking about how to remove the najasa. When the filthy area on one's clothes, on one's body, clothes, a small place of prayer or the light cannot be located, the whole suspected area has to be washed until it is certain that all impurity has been removed. Meaning that if there's najasa, for example, Allah, you go to the restroom and it spills on your, you know it spilled on your, a little bit on your pant leg or something. You don't know exactly where. So if it was on one pant leg, then you can... Since you don't know exactly where, then you wash that whole pant leg, that whole area, because you're unsure the exact spot. So by washing that whole area, you've guaranteed that you remove the najasa from the small spots, from the small area. <clears throat> Still, if the impure area itself cannot be identified, the whole object has to be washed. As... <clears throat> As for pure material soiled with urine of an infant, it is sufficient to purify it with sprinkling water, uh, not washing it. As stated in the hadith narrated on the authority of Umm Qais bin Muhsin, uh, radiallahu ta'ala anha, she narrated, I brought my baby son, 
who had not started eating ordinary food, meaning he was uh, rada, he was he was drinking uh, just mother's milk, just milk. To the to Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who took him and made him sit in his lap. The child urinated on the garment of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked for water and sprinkled it over the soiled area without washing it. However, if the child is old enough to eat ordinary food, the ruling on his or her urine is regarded as that of grown-ups. It must be removed. In such cases, urine is to be removed by washing as in the case of other kinds of impurity. Okay, you need to wash it until the urine uh, is removed. But if it's a, a, a small child, the Prophet ﷺ just sprink, sprinkled water on it. <clears throat> and the scholars also mention, and I'm actually surprised Imam Fuzan didn't mention, and I don't know if there's ikhtilaf in this, and perhaps there, there may be, but that this uh, hukum is for the boy, not for the girl. Wallahu tabarak ta'ala a'lam. You know, the boy that hasn't drink, who only lives off his mother's milk, but not the girl. And then the scholars have many... Uh, uh, debates about the details regarding that and 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 the illa, the reason why for a girl and not for a boy. But again, we won't get into that mas'ala. It's a bit deep of a mas'ala. But the imam then said there are three kinds of impure objects, major impure objects, such as those caused by dogs and the like, minor impure objects, such as the urine of infants, who have not started eating ordinary food, meaning they only live off their mother's milk. And then there's the moderate impure objects, which include all other impure objects. At this point, there must be a distinction between pure and impure urine and manure of animals. Those of legally edible animals, such as camels, cows, sheep, and the like, are pure. According to a hadith related uh, in Al-Bukhari and Muslim stating that the Prophet والسلام, gave permission to the people of Yarena to uh, take the urine and milk of the camels of charity as medicine. This hadith implies that the urine of the camels is pure, for it is impermissible to take as imp an impure object as medicine. Some may argue that the Prophet والسلام, permitted taking or drinking such urine as medicine only in the case of necessity. To this we say that the Prophet ﷺ never enjoined washing the trace of the urine of camels before performing prayer, which shows that he did not deem it impure. It is also stated in Sahih, uh, in an authentic hadith, that the Messenger ﷺ, before the Prophet's masjid was built, would perform prayer at sheaf, sheaf holds, you know, the, the places, the pens for the sheep, uh, and would command his companions to perform prayer in such places, though they had been sure they had surely been urinated in, meaning that those sheep had urinated in that place. So it shows us that animals that you can eat, that their urine and their uh, roth, they call it the, the the dung of those animals is pure. You you can you could. Essentially, they're not places you should pray in, but if if that gets on your garment, you should just remove it because it is something that which is considered uh, dirty but not impure. Okay? Uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, Purity is the or original uh, ruling on all kinds of manure except for those which are ruled out. <clears throat> The leftover of legally edible animals is pure, and so is the leftover of cats, according to the hadith narrated on the authority of Abu Qatada, who reported that the Prophet ﷺ said about cats, uh, it is not impure. It is one of those, uh, meaning domestic animals, which go around amongst you. Related uh, by a Tirmidhi, and it is an authentic hadith. In the hadith at hand, the Prophet ﷺ resembled cats to servants who go around amongst their masters waiting for their orders. Thus deeming cats pure, as stated in the hadith, is a way of relieving Muslims from strictness and difficulty. Some scholars maintain the same ruling on legally 
inedible animals smaller than cats, such as birds and the like. They view that the leftover of such small animals is as pure as that of cats. On the other hand, the manure, urine, and the remaining food of any legally inedible animals other than cats and their likes are impure. Meaning if you can't eat it, if it's not lawful, then it's najasa, it's uh, defecation, and it's urine is najasa. So Imam Fozan, he then says, thus taking care of physical and moral purity is, a, is central in a Muslim's life. Okay, spiritual, and of course the physical purity. Uh, spiritual purity requires monotheism, meaning tawhid, and devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your ibadah, in both words and deeds. As for physical purity, it includes purifying oneself from major and minor ritual impurities, as well as purification from all kinds of tangible impurities. This is because our religion, Islam, is a religion of purity. The Prophet Sallallahu said in a hadith in Sahih Muslim, <coughs> uh, in, in, in a hadith, uh, actually it's not listed where, he said, uh, uh, purification is half of faith. Uh, so a Muslim must concern himself, his, him or her, herself with purity and avoid all kinds of impurities. Uh, and the Prophet Sallallahu has stated that the commonest, the most common reason for the torture in the grave is one being soiled with urine without purifying oneself. So that shows us the importance of purity and purifying our garments because, especially for men more so than, than women, but I'm sure even for women it can be a problem too. And this relates to the hadith. I think we mentioned it last, in our last sitting uh, so the Prophet ﷺ was walking by uh, walking through the graveyard or past some graves, and uh, he mentioned there was two graves he went by, and he said, "Verily, they're being punished, and they're being punished uh, for something that the people don't think is something which is great, meaning the people don't think it's a big deal." And then he says, "As for one of them." He used to not uh, wash him his his uh, his garments. Kenala uh, in a little bowl. He used to not protect himself from urine. So meaning the urine either was maybe he didn't make a stinja, and he was you know it was part of their deen to do so, or it was because when he was urinating he was getting it on his garments and not he wasn't careful, and so and then the other one it was for Namima. They were spreading tales throughout the Muslim community with the intent of spreading wickedness, okay? So those sh that, those uh, two issues that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in that hadith show us that those are two punishable offenses, uh, punishable in the grave. And also that hadith uh, affirms for us that there is some, something called adab al-qabr. There is... Uh, punishment, life in Al-Barzakh in the grave, that some people will be punished and some people will have a comforting, a comfortable grave. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ala Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sallam.